That was nice. Yeah. I love that trumpet thing that you do there, Wanda. <laughs> Good morning. I am glad that you are here this morning. I hope you're glad you're here this morning. I know the people sitting around you are because there's only a few of us. So each of us is really super special today, more special than usual. So thank you for being here. Nick, thanks for coming and making music for us. Yeah, and Dad for playing. Yeah, I appreciate that art. OK, um, we have some announcements to share with you. So if you have your bulletin, uh, take a look. First, this coming Tuesday evening, we have uh, registration at Cypress Adventist School. So uh, the school is looking good, got a fresh coat of paint on, uh, I think, almost everywhere. And uh, uh, teachers are ready. We just hired somebody to do the preschool program this week. Found somebody who I'm really excited about. So Tuesday night, 6 p.m., Cypress Adventist School, registration for the coming year. A week from tomorrow, we have our neighborhood meal, and uh, you can see the information there. We feed about 70 people, and if you would like to be part of this ministry, contact information is in the bulletin. And just put it in your head, it's not next week, but in, in terms of our schedules, yeah, it'll be next week, and that's September 20 to 22, that weekend, we'll be at Rosario. Uh, the Marine Biological Field Station that's sitting right on the beach. It is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. So make plans to join us and be part of um, our weekend at Rosario Beach in September. Wanda, would you mind telling us a little bit about music? Yeah. So fall is coming, teachers are preparing for their classrooms for students to return, music directors are frantically picking the best music that they want to bring to their singers and their ringers, so I wanted to lift up that if you would like to sing, everyone is welcome on Friday evenings here at the church to uh, rehearse with the Green Lake Singers, and then we sing and worship most Sabbaths during the year, so 7.30 on Friday nights. No audition required. We teach you what you need to know. It's a really fun, supportive group of people who gather at the end of what's often a long week, and, and it's my job to make you feel better before you leave so that you're having a good time uh, singing and laughing. Uh, we also have all of our other groups. There's a couple of notices in the bulletin you'll see. The ringers will be starting up soon, and you can contact Shelley if you're interested in that. Um, also, she directs the junior choir. You can contact her if you have children or grand, excuse me, children or grandchildren who are uh, of that age and would like to get involved in music. Also, watch email if you have uh, children of, um, that are interested in playing instruments or as an adult. Alex Gaju will be starting up our orchestra rehearsal soon and uh, announcing that through uh, announcements through email to the church membership and the newsletter and all that. So many opportunities uh, to sing. The Cherub Choir, which is our youngest group, the little, the little cute ones that we can't help but smile, they will start up probably in October, in early October. So that's uh, Karen Baker is our director for that. So lots of opportunities. Come and be part of the music program. Thanks, Wanda. One last announcement. Um, Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night, uh, Pastor Randy Maxwell will be here to lead us in a focus on prayer, uh, starting at 7 o'clock in the chapel, those three evenings. So um, the title of his presentation is Bring Back the Glory, and he'll be with us for those three nights. This coming Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, 7 o'clock in the chapel, and we'll have a good time uh, listening to Randy and praying together. So I hope you can join us. At this point, I'll invite you to stand, greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house.
I'll invite you to find your seats. You are the choir this morning, and so I'm going to invite you to find your hymnals and open to our first hymn, hymn number four, Praise My Soul, let's see, Praise My, yes, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, that formed the uh, prelude this morning. It's a great hymn, so if you would find your hymnals, open to number four, and then let's stand together as Wanda at the organ calls us into worship. pray. Creator of earth and sky and seas, spirit alive and the chatter of crows and the laughter of children, thank you for calling us to this place this morning and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the nations, we pray that you would hasten the day when spears are transformed into pruning hooks and swords are turned into plowshares and justice rolls down like the great river. Lord of our hearts, Work in us and through us. In the week to come, make us agents of your kingdom to accomplish justice and peace. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of you probably know what this is. Okay. It's uh, one of those things, it's a drying rack, that you put over your bathtub to dry your sweaters on. I was washing a sweater a while back and I realized that I needed this. So of course, I went on Amazon and I started clicking. And sure enough, the next day there was at my door. So modern technology makes many things very easy for us nowadays, and we've gotten very used to getting what we want just with a few clicks. 
but you'll be glad to know that the church has also kept up with the times and now has made electronic giving just as easy as electronic getting. You can now go to AdventistGiving.org and make systematic benevolence part of your budget, just like your Amazon bill. Our offering today is for church ministries, our local church ministries, which is also known as the church budget. And you all know how that works, so whether you want to go old school and reach into your wallet, or go online, it's very easy to do the right thing. Please be generous. Deacons, please stand. Lord, we realize that we are returning only a small portion of what you have given to us. Please take our offerings today and multiply them to your good. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Jimmy was out with his mother in a big store shopping. And he was following mom around as she was looking at this and that and things for the house. And then she went to look at some clothing and Jimmy was tagging along and he started to feel a little bit bored. And as he was there feeling a little bit bored, he looked over and he saw toys a little ways away, but he thought about it and he wandered over there to look at the toys and he picked them up, touched them. He thought how nice it would be to have this toy. Well, a few minutes later, Jimmy looked over and his mother wasn't there where he left her. And now he was feeling a little bit nervous. And he went back to look for mom and she wasn't in this aisle or that aisle. And wouldn't you know, as he was starting to feel a little bit more nervous, one of the store clerks came down and he said, here he is. And he felt some relief. And then his mom appeared and he was so happy to be reunited with his mom. So this is to say that <clears throat> all of us too, boys and girls, as we go through life, <clears throat> we want to, uh, we, we see things in life that catch our interest, toys, other interests and so forth, that we, we want to stay in touch with our Heavenly Father. We have a parent in heaven too, and we want to communicate with him about the things that we want and the things that we see and where we're going. Just like we need to let our mom know if we want to go over to a certain place when we're out shopping to let her know where we are. Let's let our heavenly parent also know where we are to keep, keep us together. So um, at any rate, uh, let's pick up our buckets and take up an offering for all the children in the family.
Dear Lord and Father, we come to you today with the utmost praise and thanks for all your blessings. We realize that existence itself is not possible without you, and that we owe you our lives, our souls, everything. It is through your life, death, and resurrection that we are given the greatest power of all, and that is the power of choice, and we cannot do enough to show our gratitude. Lord, please forgive us for not asking you to guide us or not following you when you give us direction. We are sorry for going our own ways and not allowing your Holy Spirit to shine through us. Please help us do better. Please help us get it right. Please help us become your vessels. Lord, please just send your spirit to be with Jennifer, Carla, Anna, Lowell, Virginia, Diane, John, and Linda. Let your peace be with them. You also know the petitions that are in each of our hearts. Be with us and help us recognize your leading when we face our own challenges. Now, Lord, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. With our ever-present hope in everlasting life, we give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A reading from Genesis 1. God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them.
I'm reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. Thursday night, I was on my bicycle going to an appointment over at Shilshol Marina. It's not a bad place to have an appointment on a beautiful summer night. And I know many of you will be shocked, but I was running a little late. So I was in a hurry. And I was on my bicycle. And I'm going across the Ballard Bridge. Now, the Ballard Bridge has a wonderful feature for bicyclists. It has a sidewalk so you're not riding in the traffic. There's one downside to this, however. The sidewalk is 42 inches wide. So, you know, it's like it feels like when I'm riding. It feels like three inches on that side of my handlebars. There's the guardrail that's about this high. And four inches this way, I'm exaggerating, but this is what it feels like. Four inches this way, there is a concrete curb that's about this high. And there's these, these concrete pillars every, I don't know, 30 feet, 20 feet, something. That's when it gets down to that 42 inch width. And in my head, I, I imagine hitting one of those things and then being knocked that way out into traffic. And when traffic's going fast, you know, that's kind of scary. But you just pay attention to what you're doing. You just go right down the sidewalk and you're okay. However, Thursday night there was a big problem. There's boats on both sides of the bridge. Big boats, interesting boats, weird shaped ships. I love boats. They need to be looked at. And Thursday night, wouldn't you know it, there's been a big boat parked on the east side of the bridge for months. It was gone, and there was a different boat there. Now, ordinarily what I would have done is I would have, been, I would have stopped my bicycle and looked at the boat. But I didn't have time. So I'm trying to look at the boat and go fast. This is not good. At some point, my sandal, my left sandal, touched the curb. I quit looking at the boat. I went back and did what you're supposed to do when you ride a bicycle, especially when you ride a bicycle on a skinny sidewalk bounded by a guardrail and speeding traffic. You're supposed to look where you're going. One of the fundamental purposes of going and participating in a church is to re help us look where we're going and to be deliberate about choosing to look where we're going. There's lots of stuff clamoring for our attention, right? I mean, you have eyes, you have ears, there's stuff always saying, look at this, this is important, this is scary, watch out! Or maybe it's just attractive and nice, like this new boat that, you know, I've got to go back when I have time because I can't remember what the boat looked like, it just was, I wanted to see it. But occasionally we need to come back and look where we're going. Or maybe I should say, look where we're going. I want to do that today. Go back to the beginning, to the creation story. 
God made all kinds of sea creatures and air creatures. And evening and morning were the fifth day. And then he made all kinds of things that ran around on the ground, including cows and horses and dogs and cats. And after he'd made all the good stuff, he decided to make people. Notice that in Genesis 1, there are no names. Adam is not mentioned. Eve is not mentioned. Because the focus there is not on individuals. It says that when God has created everything, he then made his own image. And when we turn to look at that image, the picture is fuzzy because it is not one. It is two or maybe more than two because immediately he talks about making male and female and then he talks about being productive and having children. The image of God if we wanted to make a picture of God on the basis of Genesis 1, we would not look at Adam or Eve or even Jesus. We would look at a picture of a community. The vision of God in Genesis 1 is a unity of diverse and contrasting persons. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But before we get there, humans are situated in Genesis 1 in the middle of nature. And here in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, it seems to me this passage is especially understandable. We're the land of salmon. Salmon and dug furs. In fact, I, I was reading a book and said, sort of his definition of the Pacific Northwest is all the land mass that can be touched by a salmon. So if a salmon can swim there, then that's part of the Pacific Northwest. And if a salmon can't get there, it's something else. It's not the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, you know, fishing was one of the major forces in, in building Seattle as a community. And for a long time, there was such abundance here that all we had to do as humans was go out there with a bigger net and then a bigger net and then a bigger boat and a bigger net and rake in all the bounty that God had provided for us in the salmon. And then, one day, somebody woke up and realized, hmm, our nets are not filling up. And we had to move from being children who merely gathered to being adults who were responsible and began to think about managing our world for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, which imposes all kinds of onerous obligations on us. It's so much easier to be a kid and just eat whatever is in the refrigerator. But if you're responsible for making sure the refrigerator is going to be filled for three generations, ooh, that takes some thought, some discipline, some structure in our lives. And Genesis 1 paints a picture that the, the people that God creates, the image that God creates of God's self, are people who are stewards of the world that they live in. They exercise dominion. They are rulers over the land, and they are rulers after the pattern of Jesus, which says they use their power to provide. They use their status to serve, which is what any decent grandparent does, right? We need to come back frequently 
to this vision of the dignity and glory of humanity. Especially today when people are screaming about identity. Screaming about bad people. Using vile language, attacking one another. We need to come back to this vision of what it means to be human. Do you want to know what God is like? The best, clearest illustration of what God is like is people. And if we muck that up by acting like the devil, that's not good. We have been made in the image of God. We know who we are by looking at God. We know who God is by looking at us. It is a very weighty responsibility. And from the very beginning, the picture of God in Scripture is not one person sitting on a throne ordering the flow of all the wonderful stuff this direction. Rather, it is a picture of a community that is serving all of creation. I was just reading this week, oh, well, in preparation for the sermon, I was going a different direction, and I was reading about rich people. And it was fun to read about rich people. You know, so I was reading about Mr. Bezos, and Charles Koch, and Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates, and was jealous. <laughs> Man, what I could do with a spare billion, wouldn't that be fun? You ever thought, what would, you, what would I do if I had a billion dollars? Oh, I could do that and that. You know. When you read about rich people, typically, the focus is on that one individual. So you have this pyramid, all these corporations. Then at the top, there's that that one individual, and we think about the, the drive, the hard work, the intellectual brilliance that enabled that person to be there. But often, we're looking at that point, and we forget that that is simply the little tiny top piece on a pyramid. You know, how long would Mr. Bezos be Mr. Bezos without janitors to clean his warehouses? But how often do we think about the janitors that clean the warehouses? And then you can go everywhere from there. He has a jet stream, you know, what is Gulf Stream, jet stream, Gulf Stream 65. But I bet he doesn't know how to fly it, right? He depends on others. All human wealth is a communal affair because one person can't collect enough stuff to get very rich. Rather, one person organizes other people and other people and other people, and all together, wealth is created. The Bible, at the very beginning, says if you're looking for the top, or if you're looking for the center, if you're looking for the most important fact in the universe, you won't find a point or an individual. You will find a community. And so when we begin to imagine what is the ideal life for us, surprise, surprise, it is in community. No human being raises themselves. Humans are the most helpless little things you ever saw when they're born. And they're obnoxious and they're trouble. The most beautiful trouble you ever saw. Right? And we care for them and we love them. And hopefully they will become carers and lovers. But we are a community or we're nothing. We're dead. What does it mean to be human? It means to be in community. If you go to the Old Testament, you can find quite a few passages, especially in the early part of the Old Testament, that draw really thick 
lines around community. God's people were the Jewish people, and all those other people were the enemy. The Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Egyptians and the Babylonians, those are bad people. They are the enemies. And you can find many, many passages that, that speak that direction. But then, if you look, you will find another stream of thought that gets louder and louder as we move through the scripture. And it starts, well, the, the most famous one is Deuteronomy 23 says, no Moabite or Ammonite can ever be part of Israel for 10 generations. And there's a few of you who are into genealogy, but for the rest of us, 10 generations means forever. Ten generations, you're excluded. That's forever. And then you come within a few years to the story of Ruth, who is a Moabitess. And God says, oh, I think I will make her the grandmother of David, the famous king who is the famous ancestor of the Messiah. And you're going, wait a minute, I thought we were... I, I thought they were excluded forever, and here within like two or three generations, they've moved to the very center of God's plan for all of humanity. But that's what it says. That early boundary of exclusion just falls away. And then we come to my favorite passage. We could do this one every week. Psalm 87. I'll read it from the New Living Translation. Psalm 87 has a most amazing passage with this background that we know who the bad guys are. I mean, we, we learned this from, you know, when you were in cradle roll practically. The bad guys, the Egyptians, they enslaved us. The Philistines, they attacked us. The Babylonians, ah, oh, they destroyed our city, completely obliterated Jerusalem, demolished the temple. Those are the bad guys for sure. And then you come to Psalm 87. O oh, city of God, what glorious things are said of you. So God is still saying, Jerus this is a, a poem to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I love you. You're my special place. But notice how special has been transformed. In those early days, we thought that special meant Jerusalem is in. God likes Jerusalem. All those others are out. God hates them. And so do we, of course. O oh, city of God, what glorious things are said of you. I will count Egypt and Babylon among those who know me. Also Philistia and Tyre and even distant Ethiopia. They have all become citizens of Jerusalem. Regarding Jerusalem it will be said everyone enjoys the rights of citizenship there. This is the New Living Translation. A more literal translation, I think, is punchier. What God says about the people from Babylon, Egypt, Philistia, Tyre. If you remember in Ezekiel, the king of Tyre is used as a model for the devil. <laughs> so, that, I mean, those are bad people. It says, I will write of this one and that one that they were born in Jerusalem. We begin with a picture of exclusion. I imagine it's appropriate for a two-year-old or a three-year-old. My family is all that matters. But as we grow into maturity, our picture gets wider and wider and wider until we join God in claiming the world 
as ours. And then we come to Acts 17. And Paul is standing on Mars Hill talking to the Greeks. And he said, God made of one blood all the nations of the earth. And then to underline his point that God is the God of all. And therefore we are kindred of all. He quotes two Greek philosophers. Instead of quoting the Bible, he quotes Greek philosophers because God's word is not limited by the covers of the book. He said, we are all God's children because as some of your own poets have said, he is the father of us all and in him we live and move and have our being. Right now, as the world struggles with questions of identity and citizenship and boundaries and enemies, let's get on our holy bicycle and come back again and again to focus on this truth that our God is God of all. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.